Hi everybody and welcome to week five of our class. I'm sorry for all the delays. We had lots of weather problems and no power for a couple days and no Wi-Fi. Um, and I was unable to get somewhere where I could awkwardly record a vid uh, video in public. So um, I apologize for the delay, but I've given you an extension um, to uh, finish or to get your posts done. Uh, I've given you a two day extension. So hopefully that makes up for the in inconvenience of the late posting. Um, all of your midterm grades are done and you'll be receiving those via email. Um, it's going to be a generated sort of midterm grade sheet that my app where I keep all your grades. Yes, there is an app for that and I use it. Um, it that app will generate a midterm grade sheet so it'll tell you um, where you are, how many posts you've done, anything you're missing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I really enjoyed reading your first papers. Overall, they were pretty good. I think the class average was an 80%, um, so that's pretty decent. Uh, before I assign your next paper, I'm probably also going to send you, um, since I don't get to see you in a classroom every day and, and go over sort of tips for writing, I'm going to send you, along with your next paper assignment, um, just a sheet with some hints and tips to, to do a little better on your papers, just structure and formatting wise, um, and making sure you always do more analysis than summary. So uh, when I send out your new paper assignment, which will be uh, early next week, probably on Monday, because next week is our last week of class, um, I'll also send that sheet of hints and tips. Um, this is also sort of a reminder that uh, How I Met Your Mother is what we're finishing with. Um, and please, in your post, no spoiler alerts. You're only doing the first season. So, you know, don't spoil it for anyone who wants to end up watching the whole series to find out who exactly the mother is, so don't spoil it. Um, but you might want to get a head start on that because it is, the first season is, is 22 episodes. And it's not that you need to know each episode in detail, but you do need to get an idea of the characters, and you're going to do that by watching all the episodes, right? Okay. So let's talk about Hyperbole and a Half by Ali Broch, so the book. I'm really excited to teach this, um, and uh, I'll when I send you your email, I'll also inc uh, include a link to her actual blog because this book comes from um, a blog, like she writes a blog uh, and does the drawings and everything and posts them on there, and, and it was so popular that she was able to get a book deal from it. Um, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so definitely check out her blog because there's stories on there that aren't in this book. So if you enjoyed this, you might want to look at her blog. Um, she's really funny and I really like it. Um, so to start with, you might say, what does this have to do with popular culture? Probably a lot of you had not seen it before or heard of it before, so you're probably like, clearly it's not popular culture. What does this have to do with any of the stuff we've been talking about, about comedy and popular culture? Well, it actually has a lot to do with popular culture, because currently, right now, what is super popular? Internet memes, internet blogs, Tumblrs, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, right? So it actually has a lot to do with popular culture, and... It has a lot to do with how our popular culture, which used to be just consisting of music, movies, TV, uh, books, and stuff on the stage, now includes the internet and all its vast properties, right? So, um, like, right off the top of my head, I can name several, you know, there's the oatmeal, there's cake Rex, there's uh, shit my dad says, right? There's all kind of really popular blogs or tumblers. Um, that people look at every day, uh, and not to mention the, the memes, right? There's so many memes. Um, there's Grumpy Cat. There's the Dos Equis guy. There's my all-time favorite is, um, uh, oh, her name just slipped my mind. Um, the Sound of Music. Julie Andrews. There you go. Julie Andrews and the Sound of Music. You know, she's spinning around. She's like, look at all the fucks I don't give. Like, that's my favorite meme. Um... You know, we also have other internet sensations like Little Bub, the cat, and the Doge meme, right? And uh, other things that now exist in our popular culture that did not exist before. Um, so what I want to think about is 
the memes in particular are really popular right now, right? Like a picture that has the words, you know, the top and the bottom. And usually the picture and the phrase that goes with it are ironic, like their connection is ironic, right? And that has a lot to do um, with this book because the drawings are, are ironically terrible, right? They're terrible, but that's what makes them funny, right? And what makes memes funny is sort of the irony either that is shown by the words or shown by the combination of the picture with the words. So what is our fascination right now with combining words with pictures? Uh, what does that say about our culture? Why are we so interested in that combination and in particularly the irony that comes with it? So those are some things I want you to think about and explore as you read um, Hyperbole and a Half. Um, the Probably the most popular meme um, from <laughs> Hyperbole and a Half is the uh, clean clean all the things, which is the uh, from the This Is Why I'll Never Be an adult. So if you've seen uh, this one before, it's, let's see, yeah, that one. Clean all the things, right? So you may have seen that meme before. Um, and that, that particular chapter, the This Is Why I'll Never Be an Adult, is probably one of her most famous uh, blog posts. Um, but yeah, let's think about what role memes play in our culture and why we're so fascinated by them. Why is your generation and my generation so obsessed with irony? Um, and is that an influence of, you know, our friends the hipsters or what is it? Okay. The other thing I want you to think about is what does our internet behavior say about us? And we've talked a little bit about this, about you know, as the audience of the TV shows we've been watching or the David Sedaris book, you know, what we find funny says something about us. Like what we see on television and what we enjoy on television says something about us as people, right? Which is why if we're watching a terrible reality show, we say, oh, that's my guilty pleasure because really what does it say that, you know, you're so fascinated by Honey Boo Boo? Um, because what is Honey Boo Boo really about? Like really unhealthy Americans who are also really poor and uneducated. So you are in turn being entertained by people who are dumb, fat, and poor. And what does that say about you as a person that you find that funny, right? So what does our internet behavior say about us? What does it say that we create identities on Facebook and Twitter that are not the same identity that we present in person? And even your Twitter identity may be separate from your Facebook identity. And what does it say that we can spend hours on the internet? You know, one of the other funny uh, parts of that, um, this is why I'll never be a, a, an adult chapter, is when she says internet forever, right? And I think of that all the time because I can waste hours and hours on the internet, whether it be on social media sites or just reading articles or jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And what does that say about our generations? Are we inattentive? Are we do we have like constant ADHD? Can we not focus on one thing? And why is that? So what does our internet behavior say about us as a culture? I want you to think about that. Um, so here are some of the reasons that I picked hyperbole and a half for us to do in class. First of all, it's because I love it. I think it's hilarious. I think she's hilarious. Um, I think she's brilliant in what she does. She's really smart. And I just, I love it. And, you know, the fact that you all had to buy her book means that she made money and that makes me happy. Um, I also just thought you'd like it because I think it's really funny. I think, um, you know, the pictures and, and the stories are funny. And I think it's fun to read. It's easy to read. But I think you still get something out of it, right? So technically this is a compilation of blog posts, right? But you could sort of call it a graphic novel, but not quite, um, since it's a, a compilation of things. Um, but regardless, it's, it's super fun. Um, let's talk about the art, uh, for a second, right? The art is terrible, right? She obviously draws, you know, an MS paint. It's ridiculous. It looks ridiculous. It's awful. Here comes Bacchus, um, the cat. He wants to help. Say hi, Bacchus. Look at the camera. <laughs> Um, but part of 
what makes the story so funny is that the art is so bad, right? Like that's what makes it funny. The art is ironically bad. It's so bad that it's funny, right? But in a way, it's not terrible because she really knows how to, you know, sort of, she knows how to draw things with enough expression and just that hint of talent there that you get it, right? That it becomes funny. Like she's really good at drawing expressions. Like I love the, uh, the ones with, with, you know, the simple dog and how the dog's head gets pointier and pointier and pointier. And I mean, she's good at it, right? I mean, even though the drawings are bad, you can really see, you know, you can see the expressions and the ability uh, that she has to make us get the joke, right? I mean, so she is actually very talented, even though the art seems really bad. So it's sort of a weird contradiction, right? Um, she is very talented at creating bad art. So what does that mean? I think that's fascinating. Um, you know, the other reason I chose this is because even though everything she does is funny, um, she actually touches on some really serious issues, and I think she is unbelievably painfully truthful about them. Um, I mean, she, you know, she's writing about herself, you know, she's not writing about other people, so this is similar, you know, to Sedaris in that she's writing from her own experience and her own memories, and kind of like David Sedaris, she's painfully truthful. So some of the chapters that are a little more um, serious in nature that I want you to pay uh, particular attention to are the motivation chapter um, where she talks about procrastination and just like shaming herself. And man, is that accurate about how we procrastinate, isn't it? And how we get motivated to do things and how in the end, maybe it's just the shame of not doing them that makes us do stuff. Or, you know, that, that fear of utter blind panic finally makes us do something. And I think it's really smart and, and really accurate and funny. Um, the This is why I'll never be an adult chapter, I think, is particularly good um, for you guys as you are, you know, getting ready to graduate college and you have to think of all these things and how to be an adult and I think she's so truthful that you know people your age and my age too I guess we go through these spurts of responsibility and you're like man when did I become this responsible adult and then two seconds later you're like I actually don't want to do any of these things right um so pay particular attention to that chapter now the depression part one and part two um is actually she actually received a lot of recognition um, for those two chapters, and that's because um, it's painfully truthful. It's almost, it's very almost difficult to read. Um, and she actually, she used to post probably like a blog post every month or so, and then she like disappeared for like a year and a half. And then when she finally posted something again, she was like, hey, guess what? I'm, I'm going to publish a book but here's why I've been gone for so long. And she posted these, these blogs about depression and they are painfully, painfully truthful. Um, and so I want to think more about how do we as a culture deal with mental health is issues, right? Cause she explained to all her friends were like, Oh, you don't need to be depressed. You could do yoga. You could watch the sunrise. You know, it's, it's bad now. It'll get better. And she, and she's like, you don't understand I have this crippling depression where I just feel nothing. I'm not sad about anything in particular. I feel nothing. And so I really like how she addresses depression because I think, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, mental health issues, I think our culture still very much stigmatizes them as sort of what's wrong with you that you can't get your shit together, right? So I really want you to think about how she addresses depression, um, because I think it's really brilliant. In a similar sense, I want you to look closely at the identity parts one and part two chapters of the book, because those are also really smart about how do we really understand who we are? And what if all the things that motivate us are just self-serving? And what if we put all this work into being 
what we think is a great person only to find out that we're actually really shitty. And that fear, right, of constant fear of being a failure or finding out that you're actually a really terrible person. Um, and I think that's something we all do, but no one really talks about. And that's why I think she's brilliant that she puts it, you know, in this fun cartoon form about like digging deep inside yourself and like fighting past all those things that keep you, you know, that protect you from knowing the truth about yourself. And, you know, like, what if you find out that you're actually a self-serving shitty person? Like, how do you handle that? And uh, so I think that that those two chapters are just really smart. And, and she concludes the book with them, um, which I think is an interesting choice, right? Um, so definitely take a, a strong look at those. Now, as for the childhood memory stories, they're just hilarious. But I also think, you know, especially your generation and my generation, you know, I'm in, well, you don't need to know how old I am, but, um, you know, I'm in the generation before yours for sure. But, you know, people in their early 20s and their early 30s, like right now is when we feel that very nostalgic need to look at back at our childhood. Like I feel like there's really a big kind of um, re-emergence of the 90s right now. Like, everyone wants to talk about the 90s. There's always BuzzFeed articles about these foods from the 90s or, you know, these toys from the 90s or these songs from the 90s. And that's because our two generations, you know, kind of came of age in the 90s, and we remember all that, and we remember it in our childhood, and we want to think about it and be nostalgic because that's easier to think about than the future, right, for sure. Um, so her childhood stories are really funny and like, you know, God of cake and the party and when they're lost in the woods and, and the parrot and the hot sauce story, they're really funny and they're really nostalgic for times that were simpler, right? And times that were maybe formative in sort of our own identities, right? And I want you to think about these childhood memory stories in comparison to Sedaris's stories, right? Because a lot of, of Sedaris's stories are about his childhood or his time as a young adult. And I want you to maybe compare and contrast them and how are they different? You know, who does it better, right? Or do they both do it equally well? Like what purpose is either of, what purpose is either author trying to achieve by telling these childhood stories, okay? Um, and of course, the dog stories of any of your dog people you recognize how accurate and true these dog stories are and how utterly hilarious they are. And if you want to, when she does the, about the simple dog where she tests to see if her dog is retarded, I can guarantee any of you that have a dog, you're going to want to try to, t to test it. And I did, as soon as I read that, I tried to see if my dogs were special or not. Um, so I hope you enjoy that if you want to test the intelligence of your dogs. Um, but yeah, her dog posts are just so, so funny. I, I love them. So if you're a dog person, you'll totally get them and think they're hilarious. Um, so uh, the questions for the week are posted and I'm really interested to see what you have to say. As always, feel free to email me um, about any issues or concerns you have or just questions or if you want to talk more about the book. Uh, don't forget to do some Instagrams because I love seeing your Instagrams and it's an easy way to get points for the class. Uh, and look out for your midterm grades. They should be coming to you um, via email. Uh, so, yeah. And next week will be my final video about how I met your mother. So make sure you get a jump start on that. And I really hope you um, enjoyed Hyperbole and a Half.